Hello, I'm Dylan Rosenblatt, the Governor's Office Reporter with the Arizona Capital Times. And for today's edition of our weekly Zoom Q&As, I am joined by former Arizona Superintendent of Public Instruction, Lisa Graham Keegan. Uh, and she has a very large resume that um, we don't need to get into everything that she has done to, to this point. But uh, Lisa, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you uh, be willing to do this. Oh, it's fun. Thank you for asking me. I appreciate it. Yeah, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, obviously, there's a lot going on with this pandemic. Uh, Education-wise, specifically, I know recently uh, the governor and current superintendent Kathy Hoffman made a joint decision to start in-person instruction based on a metric system rather than a date. Uh, previously, it was extended from one point to August 17th. Now there's going to be some metrics. At this point, we don't know what those metrics are, but I'm curious right. where you stand on this uh, kind of debate on how we got to this point. Do you agree that there should be a metric-based system to start uh, in-person instruction? Uh, and I'm just curious how what, what you've been thinking about throughout this entire process. I do believe there should be a metric system such as Ben suggested. So I'm, I'm happy to see that. The most important thing is that the front and center ought to be, we're doing everything possible to make sure that the kids are learning and that parents have, you know, the right access they need to a school they believe is really going to honor that and really do a good job with it. Um, we had very different um, responses and different quality, I would say, in the kind of online learning. Lots of schools had to invent it. Some had been doing it before. Um, so it, it really was different experience um, for everybody to get started. So I understand uh, how difficult this is. I, I can't even imagine. Um, and uh, I was even educating our grandson at home <laughs> during the first part of this. So um, with what I thought was a good um, and they've done a good job and that was in Arizona. So uh, I do think the metric is, is important. I'm a little bit frustrated that we call it starting school. School's gonna start, school, schools could be started by now, right? But at distance and safely. I also thought it was great that there's a requirement that there are on-site schools. We've got a lot of families for whom staying home is not an option. They're essential workers, nobody's at home. Um, that's a really rough situation, and I'm glad we're trying to deal with that. Most schools during the spring did have access to a community partner, Boys and Girls Club, somebody who was offering um, a facility in a way to get this done. There's also um, a rise, we think, we'll see what happens when we hear reporting on this, but on parents who are doing sort of a homeschooling option or an online community school, um, even micro school options look to be something parents are accessing. And I think because they're just, uh, they might be attracted to that in the first instance. So now they're gonna go ahead and give it a try. Um, parents seem to be looking for some sort of certainty. You know, just give me a plan, <laughs> any plan and I'll, I'll execute it. And I need to know where my kids are gonna be. I need to know that they're safe. Um, and I want to organize my work in my life around a plan. So um, I understand that. So I think a lot of parents might be looking at that as well. We'll see, Dylan, but I you know my hats are off to everybody who's trying to get it done. There is no right answer here other than you need to be safe. And like I said, I, I am a fan of you know following metrics on this. Um, and they're gonna be different uh, all, all over the state. You know, right, right now I'm in rural Minnesota where we, we spend our summer very, very different up here than <laughs> Minneapolis. It's minimal at 20, cases through this whole thing they've had 20 cases in the county we live in and two people have um died unfortunately but those numbers are way way low so very very different um in different communities do you, do you think the announcement that uh was made back in a couple of weeks ago now uh and then again kind of just an update in, in Ducey's most recent press briefing but do you think that this these announcements go far enough uh, I know on on-site learning was a, a big thing that you just mentioned, and I know it's something that the superintendent and other uh, and the governor and school leaders have all talked about. Like this needs to be a thing, and, and it was a thing in the original announcement when they were going to move to August seventeenth. But this kind of made it a little bit more clear. Do you think it it's as clear as it can be? Like, do you think it goes far enough? Um, I, I if it gets done. 
and if that's sufficient room, right? And in Arizona, we do have an added benefit that we do have a lot of choices out there. And I have seen a little bit of advertising from schools saying, here's what we're doing, um, if you're comfortable with this. I know districts like Kate Kyrene quite a while ago um, said to their parents, you know, you, you decide, we're gonna do three models and you tell us what you're comfortable with. And they felt comfortable doing that. And I don't know whether they've changed their minds or not. Um, I, I do think it, there's a couple of things. One is what's safe um, and what are the metrics around you? How, what's the expertise at the school um, in you know, executing a safe environment? I do think it can be done. I think it can be done well, um, but it, it, it does take a lot of work. So I think what came out from the governor and the superintendent was helpful. I think the August 7th announcement that they alluded to sort of at the end of that um, press conference where they said, well, we'll, you know, they're waiting on some health metrics at that point and then they'll, they'll give an update. Um, that's probably going to be, I hope, maybe a little bit more specific about what the actual metrics are, because I know there were some questions at the end of their uh, conversation about, well, Okay, metrics, <laughs> there's lots of metrics out there. Which ones? Uh, so hopefully there's a little bit more clarification. Um, but it's not, quite frankly, it's not impossible to figure this out. I mean, we all know it's not as clear as any of us would like. Um, and, not, and, and when I say it, I don't mean the governor's comments or the superintendent's comments. I mean, COVID in this whole situation is a nightmare. Um, so whatever clarity we can get on that, um, by August 7th, I, I think that's a drop dead date. I really do. You got to make a decision at that point. Here's, here's what the metrics are. Use them um, and let's move forward. Yeah, my, my conversations with, with Ducey's office and DHS have kind of been around. They, they, they set this August 7th date as like the last possible time that they need to make an announcement. Like it's a deadline yeah. for themselves at least, which I yeah. think it's, it's, a good, it's a good move to make at least holding yourselves accountable. It's like we're going to get you this uh, metric-based system and actual numbers on the like on or before this date so that way schools will have time to be able to figure things out on whether it's right for them to open at that point. Uh, yeah, you exactly. mentioned uh, micro schools and that's not something I'm super familiar with but I know it's like the latest in school choice uh, advocate groups are talking about. I'm curious if you can go into uh, what micro schools sure. are and like it like how this would work, especially during a pandemic. Right. So they're not so new and they came out decades ago and they really, they first were in um, other countries and mostly in very poor areas where the access to high quality schooling was not good. And people came up with these smaller schools that families could engage in and, um, but that had a professional kind of background. They were put together by an organization. So that's what happened um, <clears throat> or is happening here in the United States. They've been around at least for a decade. In Arizona, they came on strong in about the past three years and we're watching them. They exist in the public charter school space and the private um, space. I suspect there are some districts doing this that uh, I just don't know about. It, it, a micro school is maybe a dozen students whose families have all said, we want to do this. And they, uh, they might be learning in somebody's home, um, but they are, there are teachers. It is curriculum that's already created. They're not making it up. It's not like it, it is following a set pattern. A lot of emphasis, emphasis on, um, I would say, active engagement, a lot of lab work, a lot of project work. Um, in addition to just foundational academics. So I think it's really appealing to a lot of families. I, it's not a Montessori program, but I liken it to that a little bit. So families who really like to see um, a lot of hands-on engagement in their, in their programming. So it seems to be very popular and this is hearsay, but we do hear that um, it's growing. So I'll be interested to see the, you know, the schools that are out there now that the governor has said, we want you and the superintendent, you're going to report your numbers on day one, which I think is really important that we not lose kids. So day one, let's get an attendance roll, whatever it is. Let's see it. And then count them every month. This is really, really important. So that will tell us, Dylan, whether these you know, optional programs are attractive, whether parents are moving um, in that first quarter as we go back and they um, we will see if they're looking, you know, kind of moving the kids from 
one program into another. Parents don't like to do that as a rule, but this is an unusual time. We'll see. So I do want to ask, since you were a former superintendent of, in Arizona, uh, it's been a couple of years removed. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, Kathy Hoffman's the first Democrat to hold that office since your predecessor. Uh, I'm curious, watching from the outside, how you think she has done so far in her uh, just like roughly two years that she's been in the job. She's doing a great job. I like her a lot. Um, and I, I had, I met her when she was running for office, reached out to her and um, we were able to be in touch and we're in touch every now and then. Um, I admire her. I think she's doing a good job. And are, are there certain areas that you like could highlight, uh, especially dur how she's been during this pandemic? I mean, I, I, I wrote something for the Capital Times back in April about how she and the governor have kind of formed this unlikely team throughout this pandemic, which I feel like I still kind of shown a light on, especially during this latest announcement. Like he hasn't really been side by side with anybody other, any other elected official in the state uh, besides the superintendent. I feel like there, there's something there that maybe you can address. Like, I don't know how close you, you were with the governor while you were holding this office, but I'm just curious what your take is on how she's been during this pandemic, especially in the Con context of how the governor has been as well. Yeah, well, the governor's just a little bit younger than I am and kind of came on the scene after after I uh, left, which was 19 years ago. So, um, it, it, you know, what's nice about this, Dylan, is that they are both, uh, I think, good leaders in the sense that this this supersedes everybody's politics this moment and for education and for the health of the state. I think it's been great that, um, Really, Superintendent Hoffman has focused on trying to get answers to people about what's going to happen with their kids, putting kids' education um, front and center. But I really, I really appreciate that. Um, doesn't mean people's politics go away. It doesn't have to. That's fine. They have very different views on approach and things like that. Um, but they are clearly making a statement, which is, look, we're, we're trying to help you navigate what you need for your kids. They both do it. Um, and I... I've been grateful for it. I think a lot of people are grateful for that. Uh, and then I just have one final question for you that's stepping a little bit away from education. Uh, you you were kind of like one of the almost, a, I don't know if about original, but for this this sake, I'll say original, like moderate Republicans. And Oh, yeah. oh for sure. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're and, not offending me. <laughs> be, between uh, like a, a couple of state legislature uh, races, like you have the race between Heather Carter, the moderate, and Nancy Barta, who is challenging her from the right. Obviously, on the presidential side, you have uh, President Donald Trump, who has kind of brought in this like Trumpism party. Do you feel like the rise of Trumpism has uh, like affected your views of the Republican Party? Do you still identify yourself with them or have they kind of escaped where your values stand? Well, I mean, I, I, I started and will continue as a McCain Republican. So I, I, I consider myself a Republican still. That is really difficult on certain days. I am not a fan of the president. I, I haven't been, I'm, I'm not. Um, but I think it's too simple to put the you know, the, the needs of the Republican Party down to just this one guy. I mean, obviously, there's a reason that he was elected. And we need to be um, pretty introspective at this point about our party and where we're going and, you know, what it means to be a party that believes in individual liberties and uh, included in individual liberties are things like uh, justice reform and, you know, uh, we hear the president talking about being a law and order person. This is a really good time, I think, to be talking about um, a history of what has happened to uh, black Americans. What does it look like in the United States to be an anti-racist? That is something the Republican Party ought to be talking about um, and really do some soul searching about. Democratic Party as well, that, that's, that belongs to all of us. This is a moment that really calls for some serious leadership. I regret that it, it doesn't come right now from the head of our party, but um, it is part of who we are. And I certainly have a lot of colleagues who I know are working on this as well. So um, we got a lot of work in front of us. People like me who are my age and um, didn't get this done uh, when we were in our positions and can support, I think, younger people who are coming into office and doing this and also do our own work on it. So I continue to 
identify as a Republican. Um, I am disappointed, as I know a lot of people are, but I, but I do not um, believe that uh, we don't have something really, really important to offer the country and balance the country with. So I'm very hopeful that people will be re-energized by what's a critically important moment. And, you know, we'll get, we'll get through this and, and hopefully we see, um, you know, uh, <laughs> we see a different result as far as the president goes in November and, and uh, a switch in party. And, and uh, I think we'll, I still think we'll be balanced. I think we'll have both parties. It's, congressionally and in the presidency. I think the Americans like that kind of balance. I think they'll do it again. I don't know in which house where. Um, but I look forward to moving forward. Um, I really do. I, I think we have a lot to offer, but uh, it's not enough in evidence right now. Well, thank you, Lisa. I, I appreciate your time. Uh, this was a, a, a fun Don. conversation. I appreciate it. Well, I was happy to do it from, it is literally 79 degrees up here right now. I'm sorry to share that with you. I, yeah, we're, I we're, that we're a little, little bit warmer here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Thank you so much for speaking with me. I appreciate it. Thank you.